Christmas has finally made its appearance. Like my family does every year, we seated ourselves around a vastly hot fire in my grandmother's backyard, which sits adjacent the Chattahoochee River. It has been some time since my grandmother has passed away, and even though it was strange not having my grandmother around, I was blessed to know we would continue the traditions established by her. This spot was important to me. It was the same spot I learned how to fish, how to skip stones, and how to swim. I learned how to use a rope swing on the tree which sat down about 20 feet from where my chair sits right now. And most importantly, however, I learned what family meant in this spot. Since we all lived far from one another, it was nice coming together each Christmas to, to simply enjoy family. We did not talk about the worries of life. We simply embraced each other as we talked about the good old days and as we made new memories for our own children. Number one, what would everyone likely be wearing this evening? Why? It's, it's winter time. It's cold outside. Number two, what would the environment likely look like? I tell you this story. What, what does it look like? What did you picture in your head when, uh, when, when I'm telling this story? What, is the, what does it feel like? What's, the, what's the, the environment like? I said it's down by the Chattahoochee River. I imagine there's probably lots of trees, leaves on the ground from the fall. Maybe it was a wet fall. A, a, a wet in early winter rains or snow could be some dew on the ground. Number three, what was the the likely mood of the evening? Happy, jovial, happy, jovial, festive, festive emotional, maybe somber for some of the older crowd, maybe super excited for the younger attendees. Who is the most likely of people that taught me how to do all the things mentioned in this story? Who, who probably taught me how to fish and to skip stones and swim if I'm at my grandma's house? Grandma, grandpa. Why, why is that important? Why, why would that even be important? Maybe it tells the audience that, that many hours and days were spent at the grandparents' house. Maybe in, in, there might have been an absence of, of parents or maybe there was a, a single parent situation which caused me to, to go to my grandparents' house a lot. And then I said, we all lived far from one another. What does far mean? Based on everything that I read, what does far mean? I would say, yeah, probably outside the normal distance to travel, right? Probably in, in half an hour, maybe an hour or more travel time. Something that's far enough where you don't get together very often with your family, right? Lately, I have been thinking so much about context, about context. Context is defined as context uh, is the background, the environment, the setting, the framework, or the surroundings of events or occurrences. I sat down and I wrote this little, this little story in about five seconds. I mean, I just and typed it up really quick. I just threw it together and I wanted to see what kind of context we could pull from some little details that I wrote the story. Context means circumstances forming a background of an event or an idea or a statement in such a way as to enable its readers to understand the narrative of what's being said, of what's being said. Therefore, understanding biblical context should take into consideration the background, the environment, the setting, the framework, the surroundings, and the circumstances that go into each word. Each syllable. Simply put, we should consider the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how of every single passage. Why was it written? Who was it written to? When was it written? Where are they located? That is both where is the person who is writing the text while writing and, and, and or where are the people located to whom the passage is referring to? when the text was written. How do the passages before or after the covered passage fit into the bigger picture? 
the bigger picture. So today we are going to, tr- to unravel some common mainstream biblical misconceptions this morning and, and, and that have everything to do with a failure to understand context correctly. Biblical context. But before we move on, I want to talk about perception for a moment. To perceive means to know, to understand, or to observe. That means perception is the act of the act or process of the mind which makes known an external object. In other words, the notice which the mind takes of objects, external objects. Perception isn't opinion, but can feed and persuade opinion. Okay, I want you guys to try to remember this. Perception isn't opinion, but can feed and persuade opinion. So before we we get to opinion, in fact, we should feel the need to perceive correctly. A challenge for you today then is just this. Are you desiring to know, to understand, and to observe the scriptures correctly and rightly divided? Or are your own perceptions of the scriptures more important than the truth the scriptures Scriptures are indeed telling you. I've got another story for you. Just hang on. I wrote this in about five seconds too. One man and one woman witnessed the same murder. On the day of the murder trial, both are called to stand to give their account of the murder. The woman begins to, uh, to state that she was standing on the backside of the victim and that she was down a hill that drops about five to 10 feet from where the murder took place. She says that she witnessed the murderer pick up a stone and proceed to hit the victim over the head while he was on the ground. She does not remember seeing anything that happened before because the hill blocked the view. But she could hear angry screaming. Because of what she saw, she testified that the man with the stone was likely the one with the angry voice. That's what she couldn't see, but this was what she perceived. After the woman stepped down from the stand, the man who witnessed the event began his account. He stated that he was standing on, at a side angle of the two men that were, that were the ones in the, uh, the incident. Instead of arriving uh, at the moment of the head blow, the man arrived to see the whole event. The two men were, were arguing about a woman. Can you believe that? The, the man that would ultimately deliver the final blow was was actually the one being attacked and was trying to defend himself. As the punches were being delivered, the man defending himself was able to pick up a stone and hit the man's leg, causing him to stumble. The second swing of the stone would be the deciding factor, however. We see from this example many things from this story. The lady saw the murder but did not see anything building up to the murder. She also had a strange angle, right, down the hill, down the hill a little, five to 10 feet, which made it seem like the murderer was a a larger man who simply was overpowering the one that was being killed. Yet the man in this story is entirely positioned in a way where he was able to see everything. He was able to hear everything in regards to the event. With such different positions, both saw and interpreted the same exact event Completely different. The lady witnessed the event as a brutal attack and murder. And then she said that on the bench. This was her interpretation of the event since this is what she saw. The man, however, saw the whole thing, which contradicts the conclusion of the lady's account. To her, the man who, who hit the other man murdered him. To the man who witnessed the whole thing at a closer angle, he doesn't think it's murder at all. He believes it was self-defense and speaks accordingly. I'm getting somewhere with this. You just hang in there, guys. Just hang in there. This, because this next example is the best one. It's the best one. You can go on and go to the next slide. I like sports. 
I like sports. Sports is a great example of context and perception and everything like that. And I'm throwing this one in there uh, for all the sports fans in, in here today. And this is a small example, but this one to me made the most sense out of all of them. There are many times where the score of any given game does not reflect the game that was played. Right? Yeah, absolutely. If you're a football fan in here, you absolutely know what I'm talking about. You absolutely know. If you're an Ohio State fan, there was a, a, a game about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, right, where they struggled the entire game. But the score was this massive Ohio State blowout, right? Don't, don't you pretend like I'm lying. I know. I watched the game. I watched the game, right? The last eight minutes of the game, Ohio State scored like 40 points, right? I don't know what it was, but that last eight minutes. But the entire game up to that was a really hard-fought game. It was a hard-fought game, and they struggled so many times. And then it can happen the other way. It can happen the other way, right? Where the score is by three points, but the, uh, the team that won by three points dominated the entire game. But at the end of the game, it only says that they won by three points. So when you're looking at statistics, when you're looking at, uh, 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 at numbers, sometimes it just doesn't reflect the overall uh, feel of the game. Golf is another one that's a prime example I could go out there for my golfers in here. I could go out there and I can shoot. I can shoot an, an, a, just an amazing game. Holes one through 17. I mean, I'm going, I'm cruising, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting par. I'm like, yeah, I'm the best person on earth right now. And then you get to hole 18. And it just completely falls a, a, apart. You shot the best round that you've ever shot in your life. And at hole 18, you your life falls apart, your ball goes into the water 100 times, and you end up scoring 100 for the day, right? If you actually write your score downs correctly. <laughs> and the reason I bring golf up is because I see it on TV all the time. Some of the, the greatest golfers in the world today will have these rounds. They're ranked number two in the world, but they'll have these rounds where they just are terrible. <laughs> They're just terrible. And the last one is this postseason. This was the postseason last year. Uh, I, I'm an Atlanta Braves fan. This is why I'm using it. The Atlanta Braves were, out of all these teams up there, had the worst record by far. By far. Yet the, Bra the, the Atlanta Braves went on to win the World Series. How in the world does the team, out of all these teams, have the worst record, one of the worst records in baseball history to win a World Series? They went on to win the World Series. You, got, you see, guys, perception is one thing, and it will oftentimes lead to an opinion a very strong opinion. The context, however, when addressed correctly and in order credits the two teams with a hard-fought battle till the end. It's very fascinating. But we're gonna get into the word. Where does scripture come into all of these examples? I have built this, uh, 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 this who thought, uh, I bought, I just, this entire thought was built off of one, one passage in scripture. If you turn to Matthew chapter five for a second, Matthew chapter five, I believe I put it up here if you don't want to turn, but Matthew five, starting in verse 33, I've heard this, this passage a lot recently. Matthew five, starting in verse 33, Again, you have heard that it was said by the ancients, you shall not swear falsely, but shall fulfill your oath to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of a great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes mean yes, and no mean no, for whatever is more than these comes from the evil one. Men seek to destroy what is right in the sight of God. A simple look at to our world today, all you have to do is just look at our world today and see the corruptions brought on by the world. I was reading an article just this week 
that, ha- uh, that have come to, uh, to pervert the words of God and twist context and meaning. Although the words themselves may, may not have been spoken, the context speaks loudly, clearly, and true. The terms yes and no are absolute terms. In this passage it says, but let your yes mean yes and no mean no. These are absolute terms. In an effort for us to keep the things of scriptures true and absolute, we must interpret all things within its correct context. If we do not, Matthew records for whatever is more than, uh, he records in Matthew 5, 37, for whatever is more than these comes from the evil one. But let your yes mean yes and no mean no, for whatever is more than these comes from the evil one. Matthew Henry, I have his commentary set. I was just kind of looking through uh, different commentaries on this. He writes, it comes from the corruption of men's nature, from passion and vehemence, from a reigning vanity in the mind and a contempt of sacred things. It comes from the deceitfulness which is men. Therefore, men use these, uh, th- these ideas because they are, distrust, they are distrustful one of another and think they cannot be-, be believed within them, without them, excuse me. Corruption takes over. So I have three sections I wanna get to today. We got plenty of time. <laughs> three sections. The first one is gonna going to be, we're going to go into some mis- common misconceptions of the Bible as a whole and of uh, God. Common misconceptions of Bible and God. The next section, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about, where is it? It doesn't matter. We'll get to it and I'll explain it then. <laughs> Number one, things I or others may believe about the Bible or God. The Bible is confusing or disorderly. The Bible, is, the Bible is confusing or disorderly. The Bible makes sense and each book complements all other books at the same time. Guys, and this is what, I, I've heard this so many times. The Bible is confusing. I can't understand it. So many times. In fact, if you, if you witness often, you run into this a lot. Man, it's just, sometimes it's really hard to understand the Bible, it doesn't seem like it, it, it makes sense. God's overall mission for mankind is shown throughout the Bible's entirety. His mission is continual in each book. The title for God's mission could be God's dealing with the human race in all time periods or Adam wrecks it, God fixes it, right? We see Creation, the fall of man, the beginning of the promise in Genesis. That's pretty simple, straightforward. We see the law in detail in the books one through five. We begin to see the judges on the world. Then the kings of Israel come along. Next, we have the prophets, both major and minor. The gospel accounts tell of our precious Savior, his time on earth. Acts. The book of Acts is the transitional book that shows the setting aside of Israel and the introduction of the dispensation of grace through the Apostle Paul. We see the rapture of the body. Then comes the seven-year tribulation. Finally, we have the millennial reign, which leads to a new heaven and new earth. If you haven't read the Bible, I just did it for you. If you if it, it sounds confusing altogether, but it's not. You see, it's just one thing after the other. God just, it just puts it one thing after the other for it to make sense to our minds, for it to make sense to us. Not to mention, this is how it happened and will happen in the future. If, you're, if you read the Bible through, whether chronologically or from one to the, page one to the end, the Bible simply does make sense. It's not confusing and it's not disorderly. We all know the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. I do this all the time. You should see me in a bookstore. I'm like, nope, that one's pink. I don't like it. (laughs) We all do it. But what happens is those who try to prove the Bible wrong will take certain verses and make claims on those verses alone. And this, of course, is done without comparing passages with other passages So the Bible isn't confusing and the Bible isn't disorderly. 
The second thing that I've heard many times is the Bible is full of killing and hatred. Therefore, God is only a vengeful God. First and foremost, the Bible is indeed full of killing, and it is indeed, it contains hatred in a lot of its pages. But the Bible itself never encourages killing, nor does it agree with hatred. In fact, we know that the Bible says not to murder. Exodus 20, 13 says, you shall not murder. But what about all the passages that prove God's love? There will come a time in the future where God pours out his wrath on mankind, but what about all the passages in the Bible talks about the love of God. John 3.16 tells us alone that God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world. Sacrificial love is the ultimate example of love. This is why God desires our lives to be full of sacrifice for him. Are we willing to give worldly things up for God? That's the question. Are we willing to give our time and our efforts and our money to God instead of to self? Paul reminds the husbands in Ephesians to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, Ephesians 5.22. The few verses before this, the apostle reminds us to walk in love. He literally says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And one of the greatest verses about the character of our God is Colossians chapter three, verse 14, which states, and above all these things embrace love, which is the bond of perfection. God is the ultimate example of binding, a bond, if you will. He is perfectly unified together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the perfect trinity. This, the third one here, the third point that I've heard so many times, and maybe you, you're relating with some of these. If you talk about a God a lot in your lives, maybe some people have said this to you. It is, it is not possible to understand the Bible without help. This is, this is an important one. And I wanna, I wanna spend a minute on this. Turn to Acts chapter eight really quick. Acts chapter eight. passage of the Ethiopian eunuch. This is a very interesting passage. This is an interesting passage on a lot of topics when it comes to the scriptures in context. But we're going to start in verse 26. uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We'll probably read through 31. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise, rise, up and go toward the south on the way that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he rose up and went, and there was a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in command of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning, sitting in the chariot, and reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit said to Philip, go to this chariot, And stay with it. Then Philip ran to him and heard him read the book of Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. First of all, have you ever pictured this Philip running to, I mean, what if you were sitting in a car and someone just comes like bolting up to you? Like, wouldn't that freak you out? That would freak me out, right? That would completely freak me out. But he says this really interesting question here. How can I understand what I'm reading unless someone guides me? First, this is a great question. Yet it is a misconception that we cannot understand the Bible without proper guidance. And let me explain here for a minute. We must first acknowledge that the Bible is broken up in the dispensations. God deals with people differently in different time periods. Second, the Bible is in its completed form today. And it wasn't in its completed form during this time when this was being written or when, uh, when the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, states, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect comes, then that which is imperfect shall pass away. This perfect right here in this verse refers to the word of God. When the perfect comes, when the Bible is in its completed form, then that which is imperfect shall pass away. And then third and final, the Bible is ultimately for believers. And what do I mean by that? I was, one of my favorite authors is Joel Fink. He lives up there in South Dakota. We go to his conference uh, every year. He says, when we say the Bible can be understood, we must qualify this by saying God intended you to understand it as a believer. He goes on to talk about you are going to have some problems if you're only trying to understand the Bible on an intellectual level. I believe especially when it comes to the faith aspects of the words, this, this is what, uh, what's going on here is that you, sometimes when you're reading the word of God and you're not a believer, you can, you can understand everything that you're reading, but you can't understand everything that you're reading because of the faith aspect. How can someone without faith understand the faith parts of the Bible? When when that, that knife was going up to kill the son in the Old Testament, Abraham, right? And we, we look back at that and we think about, wow, that faith, that faith, right? You start to think about some of these things, it's, it's hard to understand. Moving on, the, section, the second section we're gonna talk about today are, are things about the Bible that we typically believe that are actually not in the Bible at all. Anyone, can anyone think of any? The seven deadly sins. Okay, I'm telling you, the list is pretty, it's pretty long. I'm gonna go over some pretty easy ones today. And I, I, I ask you to go home and maybe find some more. Number one, the fruit was an apple <laughs> in the garden. The Bible never says apple for the forbidden fruit, yet it commonly is thought of as such. Where in the world did we get an apple? Where did we, I have every translation to mankind in the English uh, language in my office. And I have gone through, and I, except for one, because it's not, we'll leave that alone. One says it's an apple, but it's not, I don't really call it a translation. <laughs> but some other ideas include fig, right? After they sinned, what did, what did they make uh, the coverings from? Fig leaves, so some people say, well, it was probably a fig. I read that someone thought it's wheat, grapes, wine. It's actually not grapes, but it's wine. I've read that. A lemon-like fruit of some sort. But where did the apple come from? And what can we draw from the context? We're talking about context. Don't forget that. What can we draw from the passage Biblically, not that I can see, but many human tales, stories, and books would have it as an apple. So it must be an apple. But context shows that when Adam and Eve sinned, God removed them from the Garden of Eden. Since the garden is not accessible today, it makes sense that whatever the fruit was is not able to be had today. I, if you're reading this passage, that's the context that makes sense to me. I could also side with the fig idea because that's pretty creative given the, the, that they use fig leaves to cover themselves. But in Genesis 3, 7, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were, I gotta say this without the southern accent, naked. <laughs> so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So context shows that maybe Indeed, it was a fig. But these are the only two, based on context, that, you, that I believe someone can truly get behind. Number two, the devil was already a snake-like creature. This is, I hear this all the time, right? Eve is in the garden, and then the little snake look, 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 comes down the tree, and he pokes his little head out, blah, 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 right? And he's like, he's doing this to, the, the, to Eve, right? He's doing this to Eve, but where does that come from? 
Every child story has this, and the picture seems to get it wrong. Biblical context has the serpent going to the belly as a snake-like creature as his punishment. And this is, not, this is after the fall, but not before the fall. So Genesis 3.1 describes the serpent as subtle and a beast of the field. The word serpent itself, although describes a snake, like if you were to research serpent today, it's going to say snake. But I'm going to get this right. I'm going to try to get this right. It's used multiple times in scripture as figurative or symbolic language, and it points back to its primitive root, Nachash, Nachash, instead of Nachash. And it simply means to hiss or to whisper. To hiss or to whisper. So when the serpent, the beast, was subtle and it was going after Eve, it was hissing, it was whispering to Eve. Hey, try this apple. In this case, we know that the serpent or the beast was indeed engaged in a whisper of sorts. He was deceiving Eve. The Bible has, uh, the number three, excuse me. So the fruit was an apple in the garden, number two. Number one, number two. The devil was already a snake-like tre- creature. Number three, the Bible has many contradictions. The Bible has many contradictions. The Bible contains contradictions only if it is not rightly divided. 2 Timothy 2.15 states, study to show yourself approved by God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To rightly divide in the Greek means to cut straight. That means that we are to cut straight the word of God. There are many verses throughout the scripture that people attack and point to as contradicting, and I have heard many of these. But it is important to recognize these false claims so that we have a good understanding on why the Bible does not contradict itself. Some of these verses we are going to actually get into here in a few minutes. That's going to be section number three, some verses that we'll get into. Context is everything, guys. Biblical context. Number four, the account of the wise men. I didn't say three wise men. I just said wise men because there's a lot about this story that we have twisted throughout, uh, throughout Christmas history, so to speak. The first point is that there was three wise men. More than likely, this is taken from the, Greek, the three gifts that were presented King Jesus at birth, which was gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? These are three gifts, so automatically your mind is like, wow, there has to be three kings, three wise men. A study on the wise men suggests that there was probably many of them, not just three, and that they would have traveled with a caravan of people, not just three people saddled up on their donkey or whatever it was. What are those things with the humps? Camels. Camels. (laughs) The second one is the wise men followed the North Star, the Star of David. That's the one that I really want to get to. You guys probably have all heard the three wise men one, but that they saw the star in the sky and they were, just follow that north star. Is that possible? I mean, think about that for a second. Is it possible to follow the north star directly in a straight line? Pat Kilgo, a missionary in Malaysia with Things to Come Mission, he wrote this article, and I want you to hear what he says. He says, Coming to see the Messiah was easy to talk about, but harder to achieve. The distance between Babylon and Jerusalem was about 570 miles. However, the biblical and historical evidence suggests that no road existed to link the cities in a straight line. And I'm not talking about just a straight line, just a road to get you from point A to point B. The common route that the Babylonians used to travel to Jerusalem, which was about 1,500 miles long, had them travel far to the northwest, northwest, and then south again through Syria and Galilee until they finally arrived out of the north. Out of the north. And you can back this up looking in Jeremiah and the prophecy, chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. 
leads me to the final point here. December 25th is Jesus' birthday. This one has become understood well throughout most of Christianity today. I don't think you can find too many people that actually believe that 25th was Christ's birthday. But somewhere along the way, we came to celebrate Christ's birthday on December 25th. It is commonly understood that Jesus' actual birthday, based on different scripture passages and talking about the, the Jewish calendar and the different times in both the Old and the New Testament, is sometime during our summertime. Exact date is contextually and not provided. So, this leads me to my final section today. Different verses that are commonly misunderstood and used often by mainstream media. And there are a few verses that um, I can't get to, I wasn't able to get to today, but um, I'm gonna throw those on the screen for you guys so you can take it home and study them out yourself. The first one is 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their, forgive their sin and will heal their land. I have seen this verse on billboards, on tracks, on Facebook, and other social media platform posts, and I have heard it come out of the mouths of many faithful Christians, many faithful Christians. If you are traveling from uh, right here on 75 South, you will cross, go into Georgia, you will cross a billboard that has this posted in big letters, big letters. You will, if you're looking, because I'm always bored and looking at signs on the way, you will see this verse on a billboard. It is a truly, an amazing statement by God, but it simply is not directed to us today. Simply put, the, this promise is not made to us in the body of Christ. It says, if my people, my people being Israel, Israel is called by God and for God's purpose. We can look to God's promise to Abraham and then the calling of Jacob as proof that Israel is God's chosen people or simply as said many times in scripture, God's people. They were commanded in this verse to corporately humble themselves, corporately pray, corporately seek the face of God, and corporately turn from their, their wicked and sinful ways. And when I say corporate, if Israel did not do this as a whole, then the promise could not have been enacted. If these commandments were met, it was then that God would hear them. And it was then that God would forgive their sin and will heal their land. But today, is this salvation today? Do we, do we have to do all these things for God to hear us today and for God to forgive us today? No, absolutely not. God deals with us individually today. Does this mean that God would not heal our land here in America if all turn from sin? It's not promised. It's not promised. But the natural consequence of individual turning from Christ would be amazing. If everyone asked God, to, if everyone trusted in God as their savior and turned from their wicked ways, the natural consequence of doing that would probably be amazing, but it is not a promise that God has promised us today. Today we are forgiven the moment we trust in Jesus Christ alone. We are forever forgiven from this moment forward, which leads me to verse number two, 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A quick look at the context reveals a lot about this verse. We can look at this verse two different ways. The first one is that God, the moment we confess our sins at salvation, is faithful and is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number two, the second is that we must continually confess our sins in order to stay in God's good graces. And the number two is the typical understanding of this verse today. I can't tell you how many times growing up, guys, where I would be in the congregation and the pastor would say to something along this line right here. If you have sinned today, you need to go home, get on your bed, and try to think of all your sins and ask God to forgive you of those sins or you will be out of communion with God. 
And I say this in a very serious way because it really uh, it wrecked my understanding of God's forgiveness for many years. And then it would lead to this. You ready for this? If you're out of communion with God, are you really saved? Are you really saved? We know that God is indeed faithful and we know that he is a just God and we know that he forgives us of our sins. Yet we know that we are forgiven once for our sins and this is done when? The moment we trust. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that we do not have to worry about all the sins every single day and go home and ask God to please, 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 Lord, forgive us. Because if you are saved, he's done it. He's done it. Which leads me to, what in the world is this verse talking about? We must differentiate between asking for forgiveness or confession and repentance. This passage of 1 John 1, 9 addresses John's brothers being the Jews who are out of fellowship with God. Jews who are out of fellowship with God. Furthermore, it is a plea from John and a command for these Jewish brethren to enter back into fellowship with God through faith in Christ Jesus. Why? So that God can heal their land so that God can protect them and forgive them corporately. Guys, the Jews are waiting for their Messiah today. The Jews offered Christ not as a sacrifice, but as a murderer. And they still have to repent of that today. The next verse, Jeremiah, I got two verses left. I think we can get through it. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. It should be noted immediately that God does indeed know the plans that he has for us. Why? Because God is God. He's all-knowing. This is possible because God is all-knowing in all dispensations. The second half of this verse is what I really want to focus on here, with, especially when it comes to context. Similar to 2 Chronicles 7, 14, this verse is well known and is quite quoted often. Many times Christian parents or grandparents will tell their, uh, they'll use this verse uh, for their children who are graduating, maybe graduating high school or graduating college. And, and the idea is, hey, don't worry, God knows the plans. And he, he has plans for you to, to, uh, for, of peace and not for evil. Turn, if you will, to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter 3 and verse 12. We were talking about the Bible contradicting itself if you don't understand the Bible rightly divided. And this is one of those contradictions if, if you're misinterpreting Scripture. 3.12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So here in Jeremiah 29.11, God is guaranteeing us peace and no evil. Here, if we live a, a faithful life in Christ Jesus, what's going to happen? Persecution. Persecution. I always tell people, hey, don't look at this verse in a negative way. If you're receiving persecution and you are on the right path and you are indeed trying to live a life for Christ Jesus, that is a blessing. Because it says it. Here you have two interesting verses that seem to contradict each other. We have already discussed, as I've gone over, that that's not possible. During this time of Jeremiah, let's go back to Jeremiah 29, 11, he was dealing with Israel corporately. There's the corporate, as I had up on the screen earlier. Corporately, Israel awaits the thousand-year reign where Christ will rule as king. This is the time 
this will be the time of peace. In Jeremiah 29, 11, where it says, plans for peace and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Israel awaits the thousand year millennium of peace and it's their hope. That's their guaranteed future and hope that King Jesus would sit on the throne of David in the millennial reign. Again, Israel's earthly hope versus our heavenly hope. Two hopes here. God dealing with man corporately as he did in the days of Jeremiah and God dealing with man individually today as he deals with us in the body of Christ. There is no contradiction here because of correct interpretation. And the final verse I wanna get to today, James 5.15 And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. And I wanna focus in on the first part of this verse specifically because time only permits that. It is important to note that our faith today is not the healing force as spoken of in this verse. We have been told in scripture that the sign gifts have been temporarily set aside Signed gifts were assigned to the the signed nation, which is Israel, to accomplish God's mission for Israel in the world prior to Israel's rejection of her Messiah. In in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 12, we read these words. Love never fails, but if there are prophecies, they shall fail. If there are tongues, they will cease. And if there is knowledge, it shall vanish. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect comes, we heard this verse earlier, then that which is imperfect shall pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see as through a glass dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know. Even I also am known. Now, this is not to say that God cannot heal an individual today. Almost everyone here can, has, has evidence that God heals people today. We are alive today. How many sicknesses have we had in our lives? God is a God of healing. We all know and have seen that. But our prayers of faith today do not guarantee the healing from sickness as spoken of in this verse. That's not a guarantee for us today. And then four other verses, we don't have time to get to them today. I'm gonna throw them up there. Romans 13, one, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist are appointed by God. What I wanted to point out in this verse and you guys go home and study it out is that it says that there is no authority except from God. And if you take this verse and you Google, uh, if you search this verse, what you're going to hear page after page after page after page is people saying, you don't have to listen to your government if they're a mean government. That is not what this verse says. I challenge you, go home and read it out. Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. James 5.15 in the prayer. Oh, I threw that up there. I meant to take that down because we just did that one. The last one, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things because of Christ who strengthens me. That's a very tough one. But I challenge you to take that verse and look at the context of that verse. In conclusion today, guys, I hope that I have not confused you today. This was one of those messages where I sat back there and It's been on my mind. It's been on my mind. When we read the Bible, I challenge you, look at the context. Look at the context. I challenge you to read what lies before the verse, after the verse. Look at God's whole mission as a whole. How does this fit into the mission of God? Understanding the Bible rightly divided is so important. And guys, it's fun to study the Bible deep. Let us become like those noble Bereans and study the Bible to prove its authenticity. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. God, we thank you for this time that we get to spend together. Lord, to dig into your word, 
the Bible is just so vast and so deep and endless. Lord, we just ask, uh, ask you to be with us as we go about our ways this week. Just encourage our hearts to, to, read in, to read the Bible in its correct context, to understand some of these really tough verses, God, but just know and understand that they're not a mistake and your Bible does not contradict itself, Lord. Be with us in Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand as we close?